Good morning, church. What a blessing it is to be with you this morning. And um, I have the great privilege to introduce you in chapters 13 and 14 to Paul and Barnabas's first missionary journey. And thanks to Mikey Edgren for putting together to boldly go where no Christian has been before in his journey video. That was so cool. And thank you to all the great Pathfinder um, people who have participated this morning for World Pathfinder Day. It's a true blessing to be um, bringing church to you this morning in great company with our Pathfinders. So let's dig into the Word. If you'll grab your Bibles with you, I want you to uh, turn to Acts chapter 13 and 14. Today I'll be working from the Passion Translation. So if you would um, turn there with me and we're going to start very quickly into chapter 13 and verse 1. So in the church of Antioch, there are a number of prophets and teachers of the word, including Barnabas, Simeon, the nigger, Lucius the Libyan, Manian, a childhood companion of King Herod Antipas, and Saul. While they were worshipping as priests before the Lord in prayer and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, I have called Barnabas and Saul to do an important work for me. Now release them to go and fulfil it. So after they fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and sent them off. So Saul and Barnabas and their assistant Mark, known also as John, was directed by the Holy Spirit to go to Seleucia, and from there they set sail to Cyprus. When they arrived in Salamis, they went to the synagogue and preached the manifestation of our Lord. So I want to just take a quick look at this fabulous church in Antioch. So Antioch, Syria. And it's a great church because it it is so supportive. The leaders are very varied in their background. We have Barnabas, the son of encouragement. We have um, Sibian, who we think, because of his nickname, was probably African. Um, we also have Lucius, the Cyrene, modern Libya. And we have Manion, whose name means um, comforter, and we know he has aristocratic connections. Um, and Paul, a former persecution, persecutor of the church, but a trained rabbi in Jewish law. And here they are worshipping and praying, and they're such a diverse bunch. And I love this church because they're seeking God with all their might, and they're selfless in what they do. These leaders are so powerful in their church, and yet, because of what the Holy Spirit says, they are willing to release them to go and do this very first missionary journey. So off they set. They go down to the coast from, from um, Antioch in Syria and they go down and they set sail for Cyprus from there. Let's continue to read, shall we, from Acts 13, verse 4 to 12. So from there they crossed the island as far as Paphos where they encountered a Jewish false prophet a sorcerer named Elymas, who also went by the name of Son of Jesus, or Bar-Jesus. Um, he had gained influence at, as a spiritual advisor to the regional governor, Sergius Paulus, considered by many to be a wise and intelligent leader. The governor requested a meeting with Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the message of God's word. But Elymas, whose name means sorcerer, stood up against them and tried to prevent the governor from believing their message. Saul, also known as Paul, so from this point on, um, Paul is, is what is known of for Luke. So Luke very subtly does a changeover from Saul to Paul, stared straight into his eyes and rebuked him. And he was filled with the Holy Spirit and he said, you son of the devil. Remember, he was called Bar Jesus. So now it's son of the devil, Bar the devil. Um, you are full of every form of fraud and deceit and enemy is all in your right. When, you, uh, when will you stop perverting the truth of God into lies? At this very moment, the hand of God's judgment comes down upon you and you will be blind. So blind you won't even be able to see the light of the sun. As Paul spoke these world words, a shadowy mist and darkness came over the sorcerer, leaving him blind and groping about, begging someone to lead him around by the hand. When the governor witnessed this, he was awestruck by the power of the message of the Lord. So I love this. It's a temporary blindness. But how cool is Paul to give a gift 
to this guy, Elemis, who every kind of sorcery and wizardry, it was quite common apparently for governors to choose somebody who was great into the sorcery and the unknown to be an advisor. And so this is, Elemis is worried about his job. So he's trying to prevent the governor from listening to these guys because when they plug into the power of the Holy Spirit, they won't, he won't need um, him at all. He'll become obsolete, so he's worried about his job. So he's speaking against them, and Paul, realising that at this point, the destiny of this island and the governor in particular is within his hands, speaks in. He looks into his eyes and he says, you son of the devil, how long will you pervert justice? And so he strikes him blind. He gives him the same gift that God gave him when he was trying to make him um, able to see with his eyes what was truth and what was fraud. So we see he's struck blind for a time. We don't know what happens to Elemis after this, um, but we do know. We do know that Elemis um, was no longer able put to pervert the, the transforming of this man and this island into understanding God. What I love about this also is that Paul was anointed to go out and share the gospel into the new world, but he was also anointed to shut down the enemy. And um, we're, we're given that kind of gift as well. Like sometimes we feel helpless, but we can shut the mouth of the enemy. If he's perverting what God wants us to do and we're working in the spirit, you can say enough is enough is enough. Shut down and, and give, give God, give the Holy Spirit a pure course into transforming lives. So Paul and his companions sailed from Cyprus to the port of Paphos to Persia in southern Turkey. John left them there and returned to Jerusalem as they journeyed on to the city of Antioch in the region of Pisidia. So they're going to another Antioch. Um, on the Sabbath, they went into the synagogue and took their seats. After the reading of, from the scrolls from the book of Moses and the prophets, the leaders of the meeting sent Paul and Barnabas a message saying, Brothers, do you have a word of encouragement to share with us? If so, please feel free to give, up, give it. Paul stood and motioned that he had something to say and he said, listen, all of you, Jews and non-Jews who worship God. This is a very important thing. He goes straight to the Jews. Remember, it said, I want you to release my message first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. So as Jesus did when he walked on the planet as well, went straight to the synagogue and began to unravel the, the message of the Messiah. Um, we also look back just a little bit and realise that as they arrive on the shores of Turkey, um, John Paul left them, and we don't know why. There's speculation because after um, Paul spoke into the life of Elemis, we notice when Luke reports he changes it from being Barnabas and Paul to being Paul and Barnabas. So maybe because John Paul was either a nephew or a cousin of John Paul. Remember the Mary, Mary's home that Peter went to after he was imprisoned in our last chapter, in our last story, um, that was her home. And she was, we think, the sister of Barnabas. So this young man is related to, to Barnabas and maybe his nose is put out of joint because Paul now takes the lead. Um, maybe the confrontation to someone so evil of Elemis put him off. Um, he might have been discouraged. Who knows? He might have just been homesick. It's just speculation, but he leaves them there and they go on and they climb up into the mountains. Antioch is quite, it's no flat trip. These guys, um, Paul's in his 40s and they climb up this very rough terrain to get up to this town of Antioch and they go straight to the synagogue and then, as trusted by the Jews, um, ask to share. And so Paul, of course, takes every opportunity um, to, to share a huge sermon. And we love the sermon because it goes through the story, obviously bringing the Jews along with the story of the Jewish history. And, of course, the Gentiles would have known that, that had joined them, or the God-fearers, as we call them. Um, they would have known the history of the Jews. And so he takes them on the journey, but he stops when he gets to David because Jesus is a descendant of David. So then he introduces the Messiah. And from that point on, 
it really flares up because this Messiah that um, didn't suffer the form of death that our brother David, King David did, but was untainted by death, is our Messiah and he has brought new news that we no longer live under the law of Moses, but now we live under this law of freedom. Let's pick it up, um, Acts 13, 38 and 39, because this is amazing. And he says, so listen, friends. Through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is offered to you. You don't live under this law anymore. It's not all about what you can and what you can't do. It's about who you are. Because everyone who believes in him is set free from sin and guilt, something the law of Moses had no power to do. So, of course, all the Gentile hearts are set of flutter. They'd never heard this before. They'd been introduced to the message totally through law. And so now this message of freedom, they were just going, whoa, they were so excited. And so in verse 42, as Paul and Barnabas started to leave, the people pleaded with them to share more of the message the next Sabbath day. So they followed them around and Paul and Barnabas got to share with these Gentile brethren how amazing all this was. Um, Then it's interesting as we get to um, verses 44 to 47, We realise this invitation that was extended to them brought not just all the believers, but it says, the following week nearly everyone in the city gathered to hear the word of God. So much excitement had um, just welled up in the city of Antioch, um, Pisidius, that everybody came out to hear this new message of freedom. When the Jewish leaders saw the size of the crowds, vicious jealousy filled their hearts and they rose up to oppose Paul's preaching. Isn't that so much the way when we see something is successful and the Holy Spirit's moving somewhere else and it's not all about us, jealousy wells up. They insulted him and argued with him over everything he said, yet Paul and Barnabas did not back down. Filled with courage, they boldly replied. Here's this boldly again. They were compelled to bring God's message first to the Jews And seeing you've rejected the message and refused to embrace eternal life, we will focus instead on the nations and offer it to them. To this point where the Jews had it, they rejected it, and now the nations are seeing this beautiful message of freedom. And it's going like wildfire. This will fulfill what the Lord has commanded for us. I have destined you to become a beacon of light for the nations and release salvation to the ends of the earth. What a great commission to release salvation to the ends of the earth. How sadly jealousy affected this amazing release. All those Jewish believers could have had this freedom rather than being stooped with their 600 pieces of law that they had to piece together, not being able to travel for certain distances on Sabbath, having to have a handkerchief pinned to their tunic rather than carry it. All that would have been set apart because of Jesus' freedom and yet their jealousy welled up. And they missed it. What a heartbreaking thought. Let's move on. Acts 13, 48, 49. When the non-Jewish people in the crowd heard these words, they were thrilled and they honoured the word of the Lord. All who believed that they were destined to experience eternal life received the message and God's word spread like wildfire through the entire region. So... Luke doesn't dwell on the sad part, but there's an interesting little bit that I want to just unpack for you here because um, it sounds a little bit like there's a predestined um, selection of people that can be saved when he says, all who believed and were destined to experience eternal life received the message. Let me unpack that because it looks just a little bit like predestined, no one gets a choice. It's all about a predestined view of whether you are saved or not. Remember when we talk about the gospel, it goes from spreading the gospel first to Jerusalem and Judea, then Samaria, and then the ends of the earth. There's a sequence. Paul and Barnabas had indeed gone first to the Jewish synagogues and asked them to receive the message of the Messiah, the good news, but they had rejected it. So rejected. So here's this sequence in place. And Luke uses this military term, tasso, which is about military order, a sequence, a sequential order to things. So maybe if I repeat this verse in just a different way with a different 
translation, um, it might make it a little bit a little bit clearer as to what is meant by this rather than predestination. So when it was their turn, in other words, when it was the Gentiles' turn, they heard the message and received eternal life. So that term, that military term of order, meant that it was the Gentiles' turn to hear the message and they received eternal life. Well, after all this excitement, the Jewish leaders persecuted the team so much that they left and they actually shook the dust off their feet as it was a a Jewish symbol of going, we're going to break community with these people. And so they shook the dust from their feet and um, they left and they headed off now to Iconium. So let's now start in chapter 14 and we'll start in verse 1. When Paul and Barnabas arrived in Iconium, the same thing happened there. They went, as they always did, to the synagogue and preached to the people with such power that a large crowd of both Jews and non-Jewish believers um, were saved. Some of the Jews refused to believe and they began to poison the mind of the non-Jewish people to discredit the believers. Yet Paul and Barnabas stayed there for a long time. We don't know what the long time is, but once again we see this preaching boldly and fearlessly about the Lord. Many trusted in the Lord And it was backed, the message, with the grace of many miracles, signs and wonders performed by the apostles. Luke doesn't elaborate on what that was, but it must have been amazing because many people, once again Iconium, were saved. But once again, jealousy took over as there are Jewish plots to kill the guys. And so they move on, they they get warned by the Holy Spirit and they left and go to Lystra. So... In um, verse 18, sorry, 8 to 12, we hear that Paul and Barnabas now head off to Lystra. Now, don't think that these are just neighbouring towns of a few miles apart. They are actually, you know, 60 miles here, and these guys are exhausted and there's no internet to pre-book their accommodation, so you can imagine that it's kind of go ahead, totally led by the Holy Spirit. And... um, Many commentators, because of the way it's worded, believe that there was quite a company that went with them. It wasn't just Paul and Barnabas and um, John Mark, like we read, but there was a company. And and later on, we will see that there was probably more than just the guys in this company. It was dangerous to travel with just two. It was safer to to move with a caravan through these places. And, of course, this was unknown territory to to these boys. So... um, I think that the church in Antioch probably sent them a company of people to go out and and work alongside the guys and help them. So in Lystra, reading from verse 8 of chapter 14, um, in Lystra, Paul and Barnabas encountered a man who from birth had never walked, for he was crippled in the feet. He listened carefully to Paul as he preached, and all of a sudden Paul discerned that this man had the faith in his heart to be healed. So he shouted, you... In the name of our Lord Jesus, stand up to your feet. The man instantly jumped to his feet, stood for the first time in his life, and you can imagine those wobbly ankles, and he walked. When the crowd saw this miracle and what Paul had done, they shouted in their own language, and this is a key, in their own language, because it causes a bit of confusion. The gods have come down to us as men. They addressed Barnabas as Zeus and Paul as Hermes because He was a spokesperson. So let me give you a little bit of a a background because unbeknownst to the guys, there was a legend in the town of Lystra and they had, um, I guess, played into it with this amazing miracle. There was a legend where um, Zeus and Hermes had taken on human form and appeared in Lystra and had looked for hospitality among the members of the town. Apparently, just one peasant couple had shown them any kind of hospitality at all. And so after they were refreshed, they became very angry at the people of Lystra, so they actually killed them. Some say by water, they flooded the place, and all that was left were these two old people who had shown them hospitality, and they become the caretakers of the temple for Zeus and Hermes in that town. So unbeknownst to the guys, when they start talking in their own language, they believe that this has happened again. And so for fear of their lives, once again, they decide that they need to honour these guys because they think they might truly be the gods in human form because of this miracle. And so the priest 
of the, the Temple of Zeus, which was just outside the town, now brings bulls all decorated with flowers into the courtyard where the guys are staying and they want to sacrifice to these gods to appease them. It's his job to keep them happy and so he tries at best he can to keep them happy. They didn't understand because they broke into their own language and it took them a little while to catch up. But when they did, oh my goodness, they tore their clothes um, that we know is a sign of um, being upset in Jewish culture, but they would have also bared their human flesh to show that they were just humans. And then they rush into the crowd. In, in verse 15 of chapter 14, it says, People, what are you doing? We are only weak humans like everyone else. This is why we've come to tell you the good news so that you won't turn away from these worthless myths and turn to the living God. He is the creator of all things, the earth, the heavens, the sea and everything that they contain. I I love the way Paul approaches this. He doesn't give them a history lesson like he does with the Jews. Instead, he talks about a creator God. He talks about a God that doesn't get jealous and petty like the myth of Hermes and Zeus who get angry because their hospitality isn't shown to them and kill people. Rather, we have a God that even though humanity doesn't always um, look after him or or reach out to him, he still makes sure there's rain and he still makes the sea do what it's supposed to do and the heavens do what they're supposed to do. He provides food and shelter and it's a creative God that loves people and provides for them even when they aren't worshipping him, just like the people of Lystra weren't um, weren't worshipping them at all. So let's pick it up from verse 19 and 20. After this, they really struggled to hold off these people worshipping them and it upset them terribly that they might even think of doing that. They wanted to give God all the glory, as these guys regularly did. So some of the Jews who had opposed Paul and Barnabas from Antioch and in Iconium had arrived and they started to stir up the crowd. So from one minute, and it's nearly as crazy as the crowd worshipping Jesus on Palm Sunday with Hosanna, Hosanna, who turn instantly to kill him, the same thing happened with Paul. One minute they're wanting to worship and honour and give sacrifice to these guys and because of what was stirred up amongst them, they take Paul and they stone him and they drag his body outside the city and they left him for dead. They didn't just leave him for dead, he was dead. So it says when the believers encircled Paul's body, he miraculously stood up. Paul stood immediately and he went back into the city. The next day they left, for, they left with Barnabas for Derby. This is big. This is huge. You know, when you stone someone, you don't do a half-hearted job. They put not just little rocks. This isn't pebble throwing. This is bringing... Rocks to crush your very thorax so that you can't breathe. That was determined to kill someone. They, they didn't do a half-hearted job. So this man is risen from the dead. And then he just comes back to life, stands up and goes straight back. What a testimony to the power of the Holy Spirit. But they are also wise. They then take off for Derby. They made that impactful statement of you cannot keep the power of the Holy Spirit and this good news down. He walked smack back into that town and declared the glory of God and then he moved on. Let's read now in verse 21 to 23. So after preaching the wonderful news of the gospel there and winning a large number of followers to Jesus, they retraced their steps and revisited Lystra would you go back there? Iconium, would you go back there? (laughs) And Antioch. At each place they went, they strengthened the lives of the believers and encouraged them to go deeper in their faith. And they taught them, it is necessary for us to enter into the realm of God's kingdom because that's the only way we will endure our many trials and persecution. Paul and Barnabas ordained leaders... Um, known as elders, from among the congregations in every church they visited. After prayer and fasting, they publicly committed them into the care and protection of the Lord of their faith. I want to just unpack that 
It is necessary for us to enter the realm of God's kingdom. He's essentially saying, unless you allow the Holy Spirit to come in and manifest himself right inside of you, you won't be able to endure what is ahead. So as leaders, as spiritual people, you know, it says um, John was going to baptise with water um, and then Jesus was going to baptise in the Holy Spirit. And so now this Holy Spirit presence has fallen and Paul is saying it brings on a supernatural ability and you're dwelling in the kingdom of heaven when you hold the Holy Spirit within you. You become citizens of the kingdom. And so here he is, unless you dig into that, you're not going to be able to persevere and do what God has called you to do. So as residents of the kingdom, the fruits and the gifts of the Holy Spirit will now manifest within you and you will become so much more than you ever were. And so he's asking them to plug into that. And then he leaves them in their protection and he leads the Holy Spirit to care for those people He gave them a doorway. Let's read 24 to 28. After passing through different regions in central Turkey, they went to the city of Persia, preached the life-giving message of the Lord. Afterward, they journeyed down the coast to Attilia, where they sailed back to Antioch. Now, they'd done this big arc. They could have quite easily, it looks like on the map, go to Tarsus, where Paul comes from. But apparently it was coming on to winter and the terrain and everything would have been terrible. So they backtrack. And I think they had a purpose to revisit all the places they'd been and encourage, let those people know that God had not allowed them to be stopped in this first missionary journey, but instead had broken down all kinds of path for them to journey. With their mission complete, They returned to the church where they had originally been sent out as missionaries, for it was Antioch where they had been handed over to God's powerful grace. When they arrived in Antioch, and can't you imagine, they gathered the church together and shared with them all the wonderful works God had done through them and with them and how God had opened the door of faith for the non-Jews to enter in. What an amazing thing. You know what, church? You were responsible for God being able to open that door of faith to all the non-Jewish believers. Afterward, Paul Paul and Barnabas stayed there for a long time in fellowship with the believers. And we believe that in that space is where he wrote his letter to the Galatians. He wanted to send a letter back to the people that he had so lovingly um, shared the message with. And I love the two bookends of this church, of what they made all this possible a believing church that put the Holy Spirit first. They were worshipping and fasting and praying and asking the Holy Spirit for what they should do. And it is only by the power of this community that Paul and Barnabas were able to boldly go, and their team, boldly go into new areas. And as I think about that, I think about where we're at. I think about our church. We have a church that wants to seek with all our heart the will of the Holy Spirit so that we can send people out boldly to do new things. Um, Just as Paul and Barnabas were sent out to the unknown, we're being sent out to a new unknown in, I guess, social media because that's the only way we can do church at the moment. And so as people, we're trying to come up with new ways to break down the barriers and share the good news of the gospel. But... I want you to draw your attention to the church in Antioch that was diverse and varied but yet unified in its ways. It was unified and it broke down all the barriers. They were able to see past their own needs. They released their best leaders to go out and do what God called them to be. What will we do as a church? What will we do in this space? How will we be a blessing in this environment as Paul and Barnabas were a blessing to break down the walls and create a bridge in their environment? My challenge for you today is to be a blessing. Use this community as your stronghold, as your safety, as your blessing where people edify you and bless you and pray for you. But for goodness sake, use it as, I guess, a fuel station to power you up, ready to go out and be bold and be strong and be adventurous and do new things and break down new pathways 
for the unchurched, the unbelievers to enter in.